So before we take you through the physical examination of the pelvic region, there are a few things we need to consider in terms of its anatomy and biomechanics. The pelvis is a very complex area and it um, can often be confusing for the therapist to assess and treat and there are many reasons for this. Firstly it is intimately connected to the lumbar spine and hip so many tests which we use on the pelvic girdle may also test the lumbar spine and hip region so differential diagnosis can be difficult. Secondly lumbar spine pathology can coexist with pelvic pathology. So again, a clinical reasoning must be used to try and determine which structures or which regions are the source of symptoms. The pelvic region is also a very stable region with little mobility. So therefore, when we are looking at mobility within the region, it can sometimes be hard to determine whether there is any difference in mobility compared to normal. If we think about the amount of movement that occurs within the pelvic girdle, at the sacroiliac joint, there is approximately 1 to 2 millimetres of translation and 2 to 4 degrees of rotation. Now, if we put that into perspective comparing against the hip joint, where we have 100 degrees of flexion or 30 degrees of extension, it can be very hard to actually pick up any changes in motion across the pelvic girdle. So, we need to understand the anatomy and biomechanics of the pelvic girdle. And I'm going to take you through, through some of the terminology that is used to describe the pelvic girdle mobility. So in the pelvic girdle, we have the sacrum and the anonymate bone. Now, the movement of the sacrum is described as a nutation. And a nutation is a forward movement of the sacral promontory like this. It's so like a tipping forward. And this is associated with lumbar spine extension. The opposite movement is a counter-nutation, which is a tipping backwards, like so, of the sacrum bone, and this coincides with lumbar spine flexion. If we think about what's happening to the anonymate bone as we're moving the sacrum, as the sacrum moves in one direction, the anonymate moves in the opposite direction. So, as the sacrum nutates, the anonymate will posteriorly rotate like this. As the sacrum counter-nutates, like so, the anonymous will anteriorly rotate. Now, this is relative movement. And again, if we use an analogy that occurs in the knee joint, if we consider what happens to the femur and the tibia during um, knee extension, as the knee is extending, the femur will internally rotate on the tibia, or the tibia will externally rotate on the femur. So a similar situation applies in the pelvic region. We must also remember that as we are getting movement at the sacroiliac joint, we are also getting movement at the front of the pelvis in the pelvic uh, pubic symphysis. In this pelvis, we have taken away one of the anonymous bones just to demonstrate things a little more clearly. So in terms of what's happening along the actual articular surface of the pelvis, as you can see here, the articular surface is L-shaped where we have the short, what we call the short arm, which is in the superior, inferior direction, and the long arm is in an AP direction. And that nutation, counter-nutation, occurs along that long and short arm. So, as the sacrum moves into nutation, we see a gliding down the short arm and posteriorly along the long arm. And the opposite will occur for counter-nutation, where we get a gliding movement anteriorly along the long arm and superiorly along the short arm. So in this pelvis, we cannot clearly see the nutation and the um, relative rotation of the pelvis because in this model, the pelvis is fixed. However, we have to imagine that this is what occurs in real life. Two other terms that are used with regard to the pelvis are the ideas of form closure and force closure. And form closure refers to a stable situation where the stability is provided by bony and ligamentous structures. And that exists in the pelvis due to the shape of the articular surfaces, due to the shape of the wedge-shaped sacrum which fits in between the anonymous bones, and due to the strong ligaments which exist around the pelvis, such as the interosseous ligaments, the sacrotuberous ligaments, the anterior sacroiliac ligaments, and the long dorsal ligament. And these are just to name a few. Force closure is the second term applied to the pelvis, and this is where compression of the pelvis is produced by the muscle forces acting around the pelvis.
and there are approximately 32 muscles which have an influence on the pelvic girdle, thereby enhancing its stability. Again, we will put these terms into context during the physical examination.